Praise the Lord. How y'all doing? Are you blessed today? As we're singing this last song, I'm just thinking about how um, it's God's grace and his uh, hand on your life is not contingent on your heart um, being up or down or happy or sad. You know, he is a rock. He is that rock. And uh, I'm, for one, I'm just so thankful that, um, and it, you touched upon it a couple times, Laurel, um, when I am weak, he is strong. The times when I'm the weakest are the times when he can show himself greatest because it has to be him and him alone. There's no room for me to mix any of my own will, strength, desire, or agenda in with his plans. Amen? So he will have his way, just like he will have his way today. Praise God. Uh, I want you to open your Bibles up, if you would, to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And um, I've been threatening to do this for a few weeks, so I'm going to do it today. And that is uh, preach you a, a lighter message on... Um, just on God and his goodness towards us and uh, our rest in him. What book comes before 1 John? Anybody? 2 Peter. Okay. And what book comes after 1 John? There you go. Praise God. Praise God. Let's go before the Lord, shall we? Um, Father God, come before you today, Lord, um, needing you, wanting you, and encouraged by you, Lord God. Your presence in my life is more valuable to me than anything, Lord. The promise of your grace in my life that gives me an opportunity to rest in the presence of my enemies, Lord, is without price, Father. I could never repay you. All I can do is rest in you, love you, Thank you as I serve you in my life. So Holy Spirit, as, um, as the message goes forth today, I pray that you would just speak through me, apprehend my mind and my heart so that my words might be your words, Lord God, that uh, I would minister to you and I would minister to these, your people, Lord, that we would um, be refreshed by today's message. I need to be refreshed. We all need to be refreshed at times. And uh, we trust in you, we love you, and we glorify you, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. So um, the scriptures that I'm using today are from 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. And, um, you know, I save all my sermons on my computer, and I, I noticed that I never preached on these verses before. And the message that I'm going to give you is, is going to be a grace message from, from the perspective of the Apostle John in, in these verses. But it's a little bit of a different perspective than how I normally would because I have a different point in this today. And, and that's simply to, um, to give an opportunity for all of us, and as it turns out, I need it maybe more than some of you this morning, um, an opportunity to just rest in his grace, to let the weight fall off your shoulders. The title of today's sermon is When the Weight Comes Off of Your Shoulders. When the weight comes off of your shoulders. So I'm going to read uh, 1 through 6 of chapter 2. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. 
Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Hallelujah. Um, you know, and I'm kind of going to do a 180 here because I'm starting off in one direction and ending up in another direction. But my initial reaction when I read these verses is, how can I possibly measure up to that standard? To walk as Jesus walked. Without flaw, you know, we, ha we, we, we mustn't forget that inside of grace, there's still a call to perfection. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, right? And so when you read these, if you don't really dig into what all these things are saying and what they really mean, it, it can actually put a burden on your shoulders. But what I'm going to show you today is that the point of these verses is not to put a weight on you, but to actually take a weight off of you. Because God is good. And his yoke is what? His burden is easy. Amen? You see, when we're in grace and we start wearing the weight of uh, our Christian faith on our shoulders like a, a victim to be noticed, we're, we're kind of outside of grace. You know, we're kind of walking back into religion, which is works. And, you know, in the church, in your life, in your walk as a Christian, you, you do have to actually walk. I mean, it's not like grace calls you to sit on your, as Pastor Johnny Hunt would say, your blessed assurance and just allow grace to save you and you're just an a, a inactive participant who observes, right? Um, no, we're not called to do that. We are called to be proactive in our faith, you know, and... Uh, as Paul would say, not to um, crawl to the finish line, not to stumble to the finish line, not to walk to the finish line, not even to jog to the finish line, but to run as if we were running a race and seeking the, the, uh, the crown, the laurel wreath that goes around the head of the victor in this setting. Okay? And it's a hard thing for... Um, Believers, at least it was for me, and it still is at times if I allow myself, it's a hard thing to reconcile that with grace, which says that when you're not feeling good, when things come against you, when you've made your stumble for the 8,000th time, when, you've, you know, when you're doing all the things that you shouldn't be doing. Sound like Apostle Paul, right? In Romans. And to still, knowing that you're called to something higher and better, and yet not allow the enemy to condemn you. Not allow your own mind to open the door to Satan to say, you're just a piece of garbage. Because you're not. Or, you call yourself a Christian? Because you are. And that's grace. It's not contingent upon you. So we walk as if we want to apprehend, knowing that None of, it had, none of this walk has anything to do with grace. Grace was free. You came just as you are. And you will proceed in holiness as you seek him with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. You will seek him imperfectly. I will seek him imperfectly. I will make my mistakes. But seek him I will. And as time progresses, so will my intimacy with him, my growth in him, and my proximity to him as a reality in my life life. Amen? All right, now I've got to figure out where I am because that, that, none of that was written down here. All right. Um, these words from the Apostle John were written to a grace-filled people. Remember, he's writing to the church. You've got to remember this. He's not writing to, uh, obviously, sinners throughout the ages who were not saved have read these words, right? But the actual letter was written to the church, okay? A people called of Christ to walk with him, to seek him, seeking to live in such a way as to develop their relationship in Christ and with Christ. For their love for him, because of their desire for him, and because of their walk towards him. And I love how he starts it, my little children. What does that imply? That he's writing to a, the youth group? He's writing to, you know, uh, Hebrew National Church youth on fire. Right? How we all name our youth groups. No, he's writing to 
adults. He's writing to adults. He's writing to teenagers. He's writing to children. He's writing to the people gathered to um, worship Jesus Christ because they've discovered the Savior in their lives. Amen? So Paul, uh, Paul, John is looking at them and speaking to them as a father figure. Now, what that tells me is that he has had a hand in the people he is writing to. He's familiar with them. He may have been the apostle who evangelized them. I don't know. I, I get the feeling he might have been. Minimally, he is a person who has come to and seen them and knows them as an elder of the church. And as such, called to speak into their lives, he, he addresses them in what is a term of endearment. My children. A term of, I've been around. This is, these are the implications. I've been around. I was closest with Jesus Christ. I am still walking towards him, but I've learned many things that I wish to impart to you because I love you. Right? Little children. You don't hate little children, my little children. My little children. What father would hate his child? You know, in today's world, we, we see that all too often. It's become all too much of a standard in these fatherless homes in the inner city. This is not our God. This is not our Holy Spirit. And this is not um, what it means to be an elder in the church. We love. Amen? Amen. We love. He's writing to a people that he considers bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh as he calls them his little children. In spiritual terms, he's taking responsibility for his readers as a loving father of the children he has birthed and taken responsibility for. So what's Paul's, what's John's first message today to us? My little children, I am writing these things that you may not sin. I am writing these things that you may not sin. Well, that to me speaks of obedience. He, he's going to now address the issue of obedience with the church and the possibility of not being perfect. Right? In James chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, it says this, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. All right? James, in agreement with John, is really making a statement that, I know you're going to sin. And I'm writing you this so that you may not. Not that you will not, not that you never will, but that in the possibility of temptation and sin and uh, temptation to sin being placed before you in so many different forms in your life. I mean, think about it. What are the possibilities on how you can sin? Well, I can get angry. I can curse. I can look at porn. I can condescend some, to somebody. I can uh, be prideful. I can be jealous. I can be unforgiving. I can be resentful. And the list just goes on and on and on and on, right? Satan has no lack of opportunity or uh, ways to get us to fall short of what the Lord has called us to. But as James says, and as John is in agreement to, there is a, um, a methodology almost, I could say, a, a way that we are to um, grow so that we're not the effect of these things with time. And praise the Lord, both of them, um, in making their statements on this is how you do this, this is how you do that, are saying, we acknowledge that you're not always going to do this or that. That's why we're trying to help you. Okay? I am writing these things so that you may not sin. Next he goes on to say, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. I'm going to go back to James 1, 3, and 4 for a second. Uh, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So in, in these two verses, James is telling the church that your faith will be tested. Now, unfortunately, who's one of the main agents of the testing of our faith besides the Holy Spirit? The devil. He's a tool. Okay? 
I mean that in both a derogatory way and a positive way. You know, uh, there's a scripture in the New Testament that says that you are a peculiar people. And I did a study on this once, and I have a book called um, Vincent's Word Studies, and it breaks down what that means. And the word peculiar means that you're set aside, you're set apart, and you're separate. But there, he drew a beautiful word, a uh, picture illustration of what it means. When you're a peculiar person, it's as if you're a dot that has had a circle drawn around it. And inside the circle is you covered and protected by the will of God. Right? And everything that is allowed into that circle is allowed by God, or else it wouldn't be God's almighty, right? So when Satan throws his fiery darts at you, and they hit you, there are only darts that God is allowing in. Now, his goal is not to uh, hurt you or ridicule you or, or beat you down because you did something wrong if you're a believer in him. His goal is not to pour his wrath out on you for wrath's sake. His goal is that in seeing these darts coming, what would you do? What would you do? Man, I wish I had the stuff with me today. But anyway, what, you, what are you called to do? The darts are coming at you. What does the Bible tell you to do? In Ephesians chapter 6, 5. Shield of faith, baby. You're, he's, that's what it's designed for. It's not designed to pierce you and make you stumble and go, oh, woe is me once again. It's so that you will pick up the shield, exercise your faith. And in that, James goes on to tell us to say that steadfastness can have its full effect that it will produce in you should you start picking up that shield and wielding it steadfastness. What's steadfastness? This is steadfastness. You know, when he hits you, now when you first do it, you might go like this, you may fall, you know, but if you continue doing it, we are told, you will stand. And not only that, but you'll be able to start pushing back a little, right? Steadfastness. And if we let steadfastness have its full effect, we may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. He's not saying, he's not making the statement that the ultimate goal in your living life right now is that you will attain perfection. What he's saying is that is the mark that we are shooting for. Not uh, as a goal of like, you know, I have to be perfect, I have to be perfect, I have to be perfect. But just simply in, in, in the understanding and realization that as you're growing in Christ, you are in fact and indeed growing in Christ. To be able to look back, whether it's three months from now or three years from now or 30 years from now and say, man, he's really taken me far. Not... Oh, man, I have come so far. I am, I am something else. Surely I can tell you that you're a dirty, rotten sinner because I know. No, that's not the goal. The goal is that you would uh, recognize that you have grown, that you are not the man or woman that you were. And that you are making progress. So this... Scripture uh, in verse 3, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments, has two meanings. And I'm going to give you the one now, because I'm going to do a 180, but right now we're still going up this way. And then I'm going to give you the other when I come back to the scripture a little later on. And the first one is this. Our obedience, our continuous forsaking of sin, is a proof that we have come to know him. All right, now that's pretty A to B, and it's also could be quite the bummer if you're stuck in some sort of sin. I must not know him. Right? That's, the, that's the natural Satan on your shoulder whispering in your ear. You think you know him? Look, you're still struggling with this after all this time, right? But the truth is the truth. As far as this half of the application is concerned, our continuous forsaking of sin is a proof that we have come to know him. All right? Now, I'm going to give you four scriptures to show a progression here. And the first one is Jesus' prayer to God in John chapter 17, verse 3. John chapter 17, verse 3. What's going on here? I'm going to give you a little context. Um, Jesus is about to get arrested. And 
is somewhere in John between like 15 and 18. It's all Jesus talking. He's praying to God for the church because these may, this may be the last time he can address everybody in public like this because he knows he's about to get arrested, tortured, and killed. All right? So in other words, famous last words. You know, you know, do you have any last words? Well, if you're going to die in a moment and you have any last words, they're going to be what? The most important words you have to say. You're not going to say, oh, yeah, tell my wife not to forget to put the heat down at night. That is not going to be your famous last words, right? Jesus' prayer to God, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So eternal life, salvation, is what he's saying. The mark of salvation is knowledge of God and Christ. Not just knowledge of God. Any Jewish person has, can give you knowledge, their, tell you about their knowledge of God. Any Hindu, any, anyone in the world who's got a faith-based uh, worldview can give you their impression of God, the Father. But that's not the God of Jesus Christ. That's not Jesus. The next scripture uh, addresses the world, and it's the same book, John chapter 17, verse 25. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know, know that you have sent me, and these know that you have sent me. Our righteous Father, even though the cosmos, that's the word in Greek, even though the cosmos does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. All right, so he's drawing a line between the world and those that the Lord has called out. Whether And really, I mean, he, this is a prophetic book. He didn't just write to these people. He wasn't just praying for those people. He's praying, for, he, these words addressed to, throughout time, they apply. So they apply to us and the world. The world does not know him. That is saying the world does not have that sign of salvation, which is a knowledge of God through, and Jesus Christ, his son. All right? So it's basically saying some are saved, some aren't. Now, the world, cosmos, represents what? It doesn't represent the world of unbelievers as separated from. It represents the whole thing. Um, a little later on, I'm going to read the word cosmos again in the context of those who are saved. And the Reformed Church will tell you that the world simply means those who are set aside by God for salvation from the beginning of time. Not those who were created to be damned, but those who were created to be saved. I do not agree. I don't think it has a strong theological basis. I can make that argument using some scriptures, but not all of them, because there's just as many to say that's a wrong interpretation that they conveniently don't use. Okay. The next scripture comes from Matthew chapter 25, verses 11 and 12, when it's, uh, Jesus is uh, giving the parable of the virgins. And if you remember, there's ten virgins. And they all have lamps. And they all light their lamps. But only five of the virgins bring extra oil. And what happens is Jesus delays in coming. They're waiting for the bridegroom, Jesus. Right? And they're at the catering hall, let's just say, which is the kingdom of heaven. Right? And the door is shut because Jesus hasn't arrived yet. So they're all hanging out outside, and um, they all fall asleep. And I love this par parable because it doesn't say the five bad versions fell asleep. They all fell asleep. You know, time in Christianity, you have to be very careful because as we wait for the Lord's coming back again, as we come and get into the Sunday routine and Wednesday's Bible, stu uh, uh, Bible study, Tuesday night's prayer, Thursday we do bread, blah, 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 on and on and on, can have the effect of doing this to you. Because if you forget what's most important, which is your first love, and you get into just going through the motions, you will be lulled to sleep. And these virgins wake up because he's coming finally, and the, their flames have been burning, and now five of them are running out of oil. So um, they go, hey, to the other five, can we have some of your oil? Don't you know you can't have my oil? It's my oil. It's not that I don't want to give it to you. I can't. Only you can apprehend that oil for yourself. So they say to them, go and get 
your own oil. You have to go and get your own. So they're forced to leave to go buy more oil so they can come back. And by the time they come back, what happens? The five have been led inside, and who closed the door? It wasn't me. Jesus. He closed the door. And that, this makes me think of The Wizard of Oz, the movie. So they knock on the door. The door, opens, the little, little thing on the top opens up, and it's Jesus. Yeah. Master, let us in. We've arrived. We, found, we got more oil. He goes, I don't know you. And it says that they were left in the outer darkness. The outer darkness doesn't speak of a less cool place in heaven. Okay? So he's again setting up a division. Now, the first one was easy. It was the world and the church. Now he's in the church, and he's saying there's a division. Okay? There are those who, now I could say maybe they were saved and backslid and, and gave up their gift. Maybe they were um, in the church but never saved. They were tares. But that's not my sermon today, so I'm not going to get into that. All you need to know is that they were in the church and Christ did not recognize them. That's what's important. Okay? Then the last set of verses comes from Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. Let's say this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Probably... For me, the scariest verses in the Bible, because it's addressing the church. And it's, it's addressing people who think they're saved, who've done the works. They blend it in with the church. Okay, You couldn't tell them one from the other. I can't tell the one from the other. All right, Because if I'm a good pastor and I see that, I would come to you and say something. Right? These people are caught off guard. Just as with the five virgins, they were, there were, are, and will be people who died thinking they knew Jesus and had salvation, but did not. All right, now we're still going up here. All right, the weight's getting heavier, right? I'm putting all this weight on your shoulder. I, if I said, so therefore you must walk in obedience, and started praying to God and said, let's, let's uh, say grace and eat, I would just have taught you a sermon on religion. I would have left you with a yoke. I would have put some weight on your shoulders and then said, let's go eat. That's how easy it is to pervert the meaning of Scripture. Everything was biblical, right? And I left you with weight on your shoulders. There's a difference between putting a yoke on your shoulders and having a little conviction from the Holy Spirit, all right? Because the Holy Spirit, in, in convicting you, will never start piling 10-pound weights on your shoulders. You know who does that? The enemy. So when you are condemning yourself, when you are feeling condemned, when you feel like your life is this and that and all, and it's not what it should be, and, and, and I, I don't even deserve to be in Christ, and, I, and I'm not the Christian that I should be, and oh, I'm horrible, and you know, blah, blah, and now I'm starting to withdraw from the church because I don't want to really show myself, and blah, 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 and then next thing you know, you're not even in church anymore. You're not a party anymore. The enemy has won because you allowed the condemnation of Satan, because it's the only place it comes from. Now, it may come from your mind, but it's coming from Satan, because there's no more condemnation in Christ, and those who are called according to the purposes of Christ Jesus and love him, right? But you see, it does say, and love him. The whole goal of your walk is not to walk in obedience. The whole goal of your faith of being saved is not for salvation's sake. God created us originally to be a people who would be in love with Jesus, who would be in love with the Father, who would be willing disciples of the Lord, willing to say, Lord, I give it all up. If you're a cult, I'm in. Love. Not wait. Love. Whoever says, I know him, this is verses 4 to 5, 
Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. You see, John's giving us evidences. But you see, what we do is when we read these things, we, mean, we go, okay, by this. Okay, so I, when I'm doing this, that means I'm walking the scripture out. Whenever I make a mistake, I'm not in the scripture. Therefore, it doesn't apply to me. That is a misinterpretation of the scripture. That is a legalistic interpretation designed to draw you into condemnation and defeat. Both things are contrary to Jesus Christ. Both things are contrary to the Holy Spirit. Both things are contrary to your life as a believer, not your life as a doubter. They're in perfect harmony with your life as a doubter, right? That's the devil having his way. We receive clarification and a qualifier on the last point that I read prior to this, which was that, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. That there will be those who think that they know Jesus, but will be rejected by him because as far as he is concerned, they did not and do not know him. Here's the beautiful thing about knowing Jesus. Knowing Jesus implies loving Jesus. Loving Jesus implies a uh, desire to walk in obedience to Jesus. So when you read, you try to do, right? What loving Jesus does not imply is that you will do this without fail, and if you fail, you don't love me, get out of here. Grace does not apply to that. That's anti-grace, right? That's condemnation, isn't it? Yet, hey, look, we're human. I, I, I do this. To this day, if I don't check myself, I will do this. I will do exactly that. I will say, you know, I've been doing this for so long. I shouldn't be doing this now. I don't even know what the point is anymore. What's the point? I'm going to go get drunk, right? I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go do that. And then conveniently, Satan picks the, the sin you, you enjoy the most or you most have a stronghold, and that's the thing you go do. Because that's the easiest way to fall, isn't it? Got to be so careful. You know, Satan is not stupid. Whoever, verse 6, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Okay, now, we're getting to the pinnacle. We're up here now, right? We're about to go. It's like a roller coaster. We're like, whoa. But here we are. We're, you know, it's going upward. It's a climb. It's got weight. It's, it's, it's like, you know, if you let go, you're going to fall, right? You're holding on. How can I possibly do this? And here we are at the pinnacle. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. How did Jesus walk? Perfectly. If that's not setting it's the bar high, I don't know what is, right? Oh, my goodness. I definitely can't do this. I'm going to the bar. Oh, my. I'm just, I'm out of here, man. Your church, your church is too much work. This Christianity thing, too much work. I didn't sign up for this. Walk in the same way Jesus walked, perfection. Never break a law, never sinning, ever. All right, let's go eat. Thank you, Father, for this message. Oh, my goodness. Right? Now, what did I just do? I read you a scripture. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And what did I automatically do? I applied it to his obedience and perfection. What about his grace? What about his mercy? It was nowhere to be found, was it? Because the first thing I did is I picked up on Satan's qualities and applied them, not the Holy Spirit's. I just burdened you with a man-made religion of works. But thankfully, John did not intend to do this, and neither do I. So now we're going to continue. 
to John's second message here, the truth, uh, the, 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 the totality of wh where he was bringing you. Because he was, he was bringing us down the same road that I just brought you. you know, he was kind of laying the weight on so that he could expose the grace of God. Now, his second message in these verses is a message about human frailty. Frailty. Weakness of humans. The propensity to break easily to get damaged easily, to get dinged up easily, the propensity not to be able to rebound like that in truth as opposed to believing a lie, right? You know, most therapies, most counselings that you run into, the bottom line of all, all of these things is to show you truth. Now, it may be a secular truth, it may be a, a spiritual truth, but that's the goal of all therapies. Right? And, and, but God, see, he's the best therapist of all because his truth is the ultimate truth. His truth is the truth that nothing can ever shake. Right? It's the rock. It's the boulder that you are all chips off of. You're a chip off the old rock. That's where, I'm sure that must be where it came from. Right? Verse 1. Let's go back to that. My children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. I already read that to you, didn't I? Now we're going to go on. But if anyone does sin, the possibility of our continuing to walk imperfectly is acknowledged by the Apostle John. And not just the possibility, but the likelihood that we will continue in sin in this life, falling short of the mark in mind and body and spirit. Although in spirit, our spirits are seated with Christ in high places, in your mind or body. And it's not that we have permission, right? It's not that we're encouraged to sin. It's not that uh, we're getting a license. That's where the word licentiousness comes from. When you read the word licentiousness in the Bible, it's saying you now have a license, right? Because licentiousness is a sin. Why is licentiousness a sin? Because the idea that you are now permitted to do any sin you want in Christ because his grace is so powerful is a sinful perverted truth. Okay? So we can't fall into that. Um, there's a sect of Christianity called the Hypergrace Church, and that's what they teach. That it doesn't matter what you do, because God's grace will cover you. So whether you're walking in obedience and bragging of God's grace in your life, or whether you're walking in sin and bragging of God's grace in your life, both are beneficial. And that could almost be true, but it's all about heart. You see, what happens in a church like that is, you, is you'll get taught this idea that, that there is no call, that there is no uh, direction you're walking in or call to run toward, right? It's very sneaky. It's not that there's no need to look at or to deal with one's own sinfulness. Remember, the Apostle Paul told Timothy, examine yourself to see that you're in the faith. We are called to take um, inventories, uh, moral inventories of ourself, to see in Christ where we are. Now, we're not called to take a, a moral baseball bat and see where we are, and whenever we're not, start whacking ourselves over the head with it. We're supposed to do it through the eyes of grace. You acknowledge your shortcomings. You, you, uh, they're brought back to your present uh, memory to realize that you are in a battle and that you are called in the direction, and to once again take up your armor, right, and fight the good fight of faith, in which God says he will be your strength, he will be your victor, he will be your comforter, amen? Amen. Grace is stated simply as this, O lover of Christ, I know you desire to live as Jesus lived, and to grow ever closer to him, so grace knows that you will make your share of mistakes, and grace will cover you. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteousness. That's verse 1. You see, he's not saying that walk perfectly or you're not in Christ. Walk perfectly or you are Satan's spawn. He's not saying that. He's saying Walk perfectly. That is your goal. But when you mess up, not when you dive into your sin, 
Not when you unrepentantly enjoy your sin and then call on the grace of God, but when you mess up, when you stumble. We all do that. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus Christ is our defense attorney. That's what advocate means. He's your defense attorney. Standing with, standing alongside, and in agreement. Here's the key. In agreement with the Father. Redemption was his plan. Grace was his plan. Christ is the, the agent who carried it out. But it was the Father's plan. That according to his redemptive plan, you may remain not guilty. Not guilty. Satan can, because it does, it says, Satan goes before the throne of God and he says, look at Don, God. Can you believe him? I think you should, where's the Lamb's book of life? We should get that in the race's name. Jesus goes, your honor, uh, your father, he's mine. And father looks at Jesus and he looks at Satan and he goes, he belongs to Jesus. And Satan runs away upset for the eight billionth time. Right? He is the propitiation of our sins. Now, I'm, I'm willing to bet most of you probably don't really understand what that word means, propitiation. See, he's the redeemer, he's the savior, he's the propitiation, right? He's a lot of different things, a lot of different words for our Messiah and Savior. Propitiation is one of the most important. The word is Latin and brings into its English use the atmosphere of heathen rites for winning the favor or averting the anger of the gods. So it's a Greek word that's applied to a heathen culture that has now been applied to Jesus Christ in a Christian culture with Christian application. And that is that as the propitiation for our sins, Jesus has diverted, uh, he has won the favor of the Father for you and averted the anger of God towards you. Now, how did he do that? Where did it go? On him. It didn't just bounce off and go away. People don't realize that on the cross, he, he bore anger. He bore wrath. He bore pain. He bore suffering. He bore anguish that had your name on it, that had my name on it. So there was something um, very unjust, unjust about what happened to Jesus. But in his mind, it was perfectly fine because he did it for people he loved that were his, that were called according to his purposes. Amen? Amen. He is the propitiation for our sins. Now, in Strong's, the word propitiation means, Strong's def defines Greek words in English. Atonement. That is concretely, not quicksandly, right? Not silly puddly. Concretely, an expiator. Okay, Chris, now I'm lost again. What's an expiator? He is concretely the person, uh, to expiate means the act of making satisfaction for an offense. All right, so he has concretely, in God's eyes, made satisfaction for, for your offense and my offense by which the guilt is done away. Past, present, and future sins repented of to the cross are done away. There's no room for guilt in your life in, 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 in a condemning kind of way. Now look, when you're, when you're convicted of doing something wrong by the Holy Spirit, you feel guilty. But that's as far as it should go. May your, your conviction turn you towards the love and grace of God, and may that love compel you to continue your walk. Not guilt, not condemnation. Take the weight off your shoulders. The obligation of the offended person to punish the crime is canceled. Who's the offended person? The father. Remember David when he sinned again with Bathsheba and got caught? And, and Nathan called him out, and then, and then David repented in Psalm 53 or 51, I forget. And he goes, the way it starts is, O Lord, against you and you alone have I sinned by doing this thing. It's like, what? You had a, an affair with Bathsheba. You got her pregnant. You had a son. Then you, no, you got her pregnant. 
you want, she wasn't your wife, so you went and you had her husband put in the front line so that he'd be killed. That was murder. You coveted. Where is God in all this? And David looks and he goes, God, against you and you alone have I sinned. He was God's anointed. You are God's anointed. When we sin, the first person we sin against is the Father. And yet it tells us here, the obligation of the Father to punish you is canceled by Jesus Christ. There's no more guilt. There's no more offense. Concretely. I love that word. Not silly puddly. Right? But we play this little game where, where we just keep on picking up the condemnation and, and, and saying we deserve, we deserve, we deserve, we deserve. Just stop that already. It's canceled. You will make mistakes. The goal is not to wallow in your mistake. The goal is not to embrace more mistakes because of the one mistake and get into a vicious cycle of destruction in your life. The goal is simply acknowledge your mistake, put your armor back on, and continue your walk. Continue. Verse 2, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, cosmos. Not just for the sins of the, the saved. Not just for the sins for the reformed church. The whole world. I was lost and now I'm found. I was part of that cosmos. You were part of that cosmos. But he died for you. Now, I understand the whole, you know, um, predestined and elected. We are and we were. But, but this says right here that the opportunity was there for everyone and is there for everyone and will be there for everyone until the age of grace has completed, the dispensation of grace. Okay? Now, there's, I can theoretically continue to apply this so that it fits more nicely into a reform box, and that's to say that even though it applied to everyone, also since the beginning of time, God knew Jim over here would never come to grace. So therefore, Jim was created with the destiny in mind that he'd go to hell. And that's true. But not because God prevented him from going to heaven. He prevented himself from going to heaven. God just knew it. And now we're going to go right back to the beginning, and we're almost through. Verse 3. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Remember I told you when I first read this that there was two meanings. That I was Just like my sermon, there's the meaning that it puts all the weight in your shoulders, and then there's the other meaning. Here we arrive back at the verse of dual meanings, the first of which is focused on obedience, which left alone can leave us feeling guilty and condemned. The whole truth of this verse speaks of the heart, not of perfect performance. The false convert, or as the Bible calls them, the tares, who sit alongside the wheat in church still sin. And truly, or soundly saved people, will also still sin. So you may look at the church and you can't see who's a true convert and a false convert because both look the same. And if you're on the outside and you're looking at two people through the, a saved person and, a, and another person who's not saved through the eyes of the world, in many ways you won't be able to tell the difference. Now we're supposed to be able to uh, shine so that they can tell the difference. Amen? The point of your walk is not to leave you in a state as just as you are and, and, and you know, no growth needed and no sanctification in your life and no in further in intimacy with God. But like I say so many times, when, when um, you stand before the Lord, if, if they took me and they put me before the Lord and then you took a lost person who maybe was um, really addicted to drugs and hurt people and did all this and they're not going to heaven, and, you know, no, I'm going to rephrase that. I messed that up. If you took a person who, in the church, didn't look so great, right? They were saved, but, you know, they, they had problems, and, and they didn't, you know, maybe they were from uh, Corn, uh, uh, Cornhill or, or Harlem or the Bronx, and, and they were down and out for so much of their life, and then they found Jesus, and, and, he, and he saved them mightily, 
and, and they're standing next to the throne of grace with somebody from New Hartford. Great philanthropist. Gave money to the American Heart Association every year. Right? Church every Sunday. Hail Marys every Sunday. And God looks at them and he goes, Sir, you from the Bronx, J Joe? I want you to go on the right with my sheep. You, who are you? I don't know you, you worker of lawlessness. You see, goodness does not mean lawful. Okay? And he'll look at God, this person from New Hartford or from wherever, man, from upper Manhattan. And he'll look at God and he'll say, you're, gonna, you're letting him in and you're not letting me in? Because in the end, it's not about what you do. It's not about how well you perform. It's about the grace of God shed abroad in your hearts and evidenced by the presence of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Because if you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, I don't care how much you've grown in grace, you know God. You were saved the day you were saved. You weren't set on a course that you had to continue to attain salvation, like so many religions will tell you. All right? You were saved, you're, when you are saved and you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, you have an innate knowledge of God. Enough so that if you were to die that day before you were able to forsake anything, he would still look at you and know you. And you would know him. There's more to know, obviously, but grace saves on the day you were saved. And it's not something you have to work towards continuously. Um, in, in, in Islam and Roman Catholicism, particularly, you are on a, a progressive chart of whatever. In, in Islam, your whole life remains, eh, maybe he'll save you, maybe he won't. That's the promise of Islam, summed up in one sentence. There's no certainty. In Roman Catholicism, you'll continue and you'll end up in heaven, but first you've got to go to purgatory and burn in fire for 100 years, 200 years, 1,000 years, because the propitiation of Christ on the cross was not good enough, you see. It's false religion, okay? Nothing wrong with feeling convicted or even guilty when we fall short, but we need to stop condemning ourselves. It's got to stop. For each one of us, we have to stop condemning ourselves. At the same time, I hope that we're not laughingly and joyfully rolling in the mud of our sin. Because that's missing the boat just as much. Right? We love him. And we have a clear goal that we're running towards. Jesus. Christ in us. So if this is you, I'd like to just um, take a moment to just bow my head and pray to the Lord and uh, just thank him. I want to take a few minutes just to, um, just to sit in his presence and to um, acknowledge who he is in our life. Father God. Lord, for so long I've been playing this, um, I've been on this uh, merry-go-round of, of obedience and disobedience, but, but not so much that, Lord, as um, feeling accepted and feeling condemned, Lord. And it's so easy for me to play that game. But Lord, as John the Apostle showed us today, Lord, we're not supposed to do that. That's not what it meant to walk um, as you walked, Lord. To walk as you walk, yes, I know that I'm called to... Um, to higher things and to um, come ever closer to you and bad parts of me that aren't of you die, Lord. But I also know that to walk as you walk, that you were grace-filled and you were loving and merciful and compassionate to those who sought you with their heart, mind, soul, and strength, Lord. And we declare to you right now, Lord, we seek you with our heart, mind, soul, and strength, Lord. And where we say that we, be, um, that we believe, help us with our belief, May you please, Lord, strengthen us in the areas where we doubt, where we're weak, and where we still yet fall, Lord God. And I just say right now, Lord, with you as a witness, that 
Satan and you condemnation, you have no place. I am done. I am a child of the king. I am his. I'm not perfect, but he is. And he is in me. And he covers me. He is permeating my very being through and through. So I'll acknowledge when I make my mistakes, but I won't condemn myself anymore. And may those mistakes and my acknowledgement to you, Lord, just cause me to appreciate your grace more and more each day in my life. More and more each day in my life. I just want to speak the Lord's grace over you right now over this congregation. With eyes closed, just let, let his grace just wash over you for a moment, or two, or three, or ten. Think of anything that you could have done the last few days that was not godly, and just watch that grace like a big tub of water being poured over you. Wash it away. And just think, that water, that water goes down, gets caught, gets brought back up and dumped over you again. You never stop getting dumped over <laughs> with that cleansing water. And it doesn't matter what you did. Do you love him? You see. Do you desire him with your heart, mind, soul, and strength? It doesn't say with your perfection. He'll take care of that in you. Our goal is simply to keep walking closer to him every day. Grace, wash over us. Pour yourself out, Holy Spirit. Pour yourself out, Holy Spirit. Nothing can defeat his grace in your life. If you receive it, it will do its work. It is doing its work, and it will continue to do its work in your life. Lord, we trust in you that where we are today, Lord, you were not pulled, uh, you were not uh, caught off guard, that you still and always will be working your plan out in our life. God. Just rest in His grace. It's washing you clean over and over again. May all those times where we're so quick to um, do the familiar and grab hold of self condemnation or open the door where Satan can. Uh, condemn us, be replaced when we have those times where we need his grace to remind us of it and bask in it. Even though you messed up, you can still bask in his grace. Just don't let it become an excuse to sin. Bask in his grace, receive his love, receive his compassion, receive his forgiveness in your life. You know, he doesn't stop loving you because of your imperfection. He doesn't pull his grace away from you because you made a mistake. Don't pull yourself away from him. Lord, I thank you. You know, another word for grace really is love. Lord, let your love wash over this congregation. Condemnation. Did I say condemnation or congregation? That both works. Let your love wash over the condemnation. Let your love wash over this congregation. In condemnation, you are gone. There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus and are called according to his purposes and love him. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. Father God, I thank you for this word today, Lord. And um, I just uh, 
the word that goes through my mind is renewal. May we be just renewed by that love and that grace and that condemnation. It doesn't mean you have to go run out and do something. It just means that you can just rest today, man. It's Sunday. Just rest. Know that he loves you today. You got your armor, right? You know you're in a race, right? You know who's at the end of that race, right? We're not walking there. We're not, we're not skipping there. We're not crawling there. We're running there. And he, it's his job, it's his responsibility to get you there. And he promises you will. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father God, I thank you for this word today, Lord. We commit ourselves once again to your care and your love. May your grace have its way in my life and our lives, Lord. May we shine like the lights of the gospel that we are called to do, to be. And Lord, would you please bless the meal we're going to receive in a few minutes and use it according to your purposes as the worship team comes back up and plays another